This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Shall we um, ask Miri Dawn and Pauline, first of all, to maybe respond? Because I saw them both taking notes. Um, uh, would you like Dawn to start? Or? Should I expect the class to respond to that? So, my participants are broadly they would identify as, as middle class, predominantly white um, couple would fit in, into that. Some of my women do um, identify as, as, as working class. Again, it, it was just trying to get that diversity in the research sample. When you're dealing with sensitive issues, sometimes you just have to get the people who are happiest to talk to you <laughs> in the time frame you've got. So there are limitations to those pragmatic decisions when you're undertaking field work. Um, so that's that kind of response. So, does that help? Is that what you were kind of going for? Is it really important? I suppose it's just the, the inter intersection of class with, with religion um, into these dynamics, and particularly because um, I, I, you know, the, the research seems to indicate that working class and middle class women have a different, um, that they're, they're framed in different ways, you know, you know, and this idea of value comes across very strongly about you know, um, the, the way in which a distinction is made. You know, the, the working class woman, as, as, as Beth Scaife looks at, is talked in terms of, she's talked of in terms of disgust. And we get this narrative of disgust that emerges in the novel of Rosie Carpenter. It's, it's a continual theme throughout the book, book and this notion of dirt and so forth. So I think there's, there's a lot of interesting um, dimensions that could be teased out there. Yeah, and that's, I think, I think you're right, it's too early for me to pull that out in more than what I've just what I've just shared with you, I guess. Um, I was at a, a, an event not so long ago on um, the new politics of mothering and neoliberals age from about the weak centre, and that was definitely one of the things that was kind of through all the it's not religion, it was largely absent from that conversation. So on some of the major Tyler's work, um that Taylor's work, and that would be helpful for their status. Yeah, I think on both of those things, the plus standard ship, Rosie is probably not quite working class. Her mother is an entrepreneur, effectively, and does at one stage make quite a lot of money in the stock exchange. So she's a top working class, bottom of the class. But she is certainly looked down on by most commentators as passive and as a bad mother. Questionably whether she is a bad mother, or whether it's just that her experience is somewhat exaggerated, as it were, by the author. I think mothering is on a continuum, and I think most mothers will have experienced what Rosie experiences, the difficulty of dealing with a child which cries continually and refuses to feed, and also the feeling that they really would like to be rid of this child if only for a day. I think that's almost universal. Mally and Dia all pushes her characters to what she calls the limit of what is supportable. And she does push Rosie there, and Rosie probably falls over the edge, fortunately, she does it. doesn't. Um, I just wanted to mention very briefly um, the Virgin Mary mothering, because in fact the Gospels don't have very much to say about how the Virgin Mary actually mothered. And what they do say, correct me if I'm wrong, is pretty negative, really. I mean, Christ tends to be saying that his mother turns up and go away, and it's nothing to do with me. Um, Sorry, I'm busy teaching in the temple. I didn't actually want to see you just now. I'm not lost. I'm doing my own thing. Right at the very end, he entrusts Mary to the care of John, I think, isn't it? Is that duty? Is that love of some or other? I don't know. But I, it's interesting to see how this mythology of the Virgin Mary as a mother has been built up just out of the fact that actually she had a baby. Actually. For my participants, um, the kind of Mary is, is, is quite important. Um, I remember one of my participants kind of saying, before I was pregnant, I was like totally not about Mary, and now I'm totally about Mary, Mary, Mary. And, and that's how I said totally all about Mary, Mary, because at least it's one figure that she can attach to. She's very critical of it. So again, and she comes from a Protestant background, so that was kind of surprising. Um, but something else that you said was, um, we were talking about the, the way in which childlessness is, is being very negative, as it, it seems as a positive choice that it's, you know, you get the rhetoric of the selfish kind of woman choosing not to have, not to have children. And um, what I'm kind of unpicking with the women who've chosen not to have children in, in my sample is their strategies that they develop for, for those expectations. So one of my participants, another one who, who was ordained, she just says, well, I'm, I'm 
know, I, she's actually really kind of defining what marriage means here. She says marriage really doesn't mean children, it means my husband and myself. And I said, well, how do you deal with that? You're in a church, you've all got that glare on you the whole time. And she just said, I just develop the don't F with me by. <laughs> the don't ask, don't go there. You know, and, and I think so they're interesting kind of strategies actually for how they're justifying and reconciling that with those expectations, which I think you asked about the difference between the mates, I think it is heightened in the in, 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 Okay, let's um, open the floor for questions. Yes, and thanks, that's a great it's a great panel. Um, and I, I I'm not sure if this is going to turn into a question or a comment, but um, it's somewhere in between. Um, but I wanted to pick up on, um, partly on the one of the tense of mother in it that you referred to. Um, and I really enjoyed your paper point, and I haven't read the novel yet, I've read the extract, and I've desperately wanted to read the whole thing. Now, it, just, it sounds like one of the things that's worked on the of literature that I've discovered through the playing of you, which is fantastic. Uh, but I was struck by a couple of comments that you made. One was towards the end of your paper where you said it's the, it's the very closeness and exclusiveness of this mother-child relation that is disastrous. And that did take me back um, to some of the elements of the goddess spirituality model we were thinking about this morning that I find mm -hmm. most troubling. I think from comments from other people, other people find troubling to some extent. Um, insofar as there are some aspects of that model that do seem to we inscribe precisely a model of intent, a very idealistic model of intensive mothering. And, I, and in particular, um, what you were talking about, the closest and exclusiveness comes through the language of fusion in, in that, that goddess spirituality model. And I just wanted to sort of, um, partly to do another quick plug for Alison Stenter's book, which is fantastic. I've just been reading it for reviews, so I've been but one of the things that Alison does that I think is really helpful, just as a sort of conceptual move, is arguing that, we, that, that it is that model of, of fusion that is so damaging. But, but of course she points out the model of fusion actually goes hand in hand with the model of the autonomous subject. And so you know, the, the traditional story of why to become an autonomous subject, subject, the thing you must do is break from the mother. That's the, this is the key stage. So she says, she argues instead of having a model of fusion followed by separation, um, she wants to replace that with the language of differentiation, which is always a process and always a negotiation, and in which the mother is always an active participant and not... And then that can vary, as you said, on, on her continuum in complex dynamics. I, I found that a really helpful move to sort of think of that relation in terms of differentiation. So that the mother doesn't disappear as this sort of passive resource or self-sacrificing container or whatever. Um, and then the other, the other thing that, that Alison does and, and other people have done, um, it, I mean, Alison wants to insist that feminism is very good about thinking of women as subjects, and not very good actually about thinking of mothers as subjects, specifically as mothers and not as women. Yeah. Um, and again, she, she sort of points to a lot of the things we've been talking about today about needing them to rethink what we mean by a subject so that it can encompass all of the ambivalence and the messiness and the relationality and dependency of people talking about. And I, I really liked your point about how every pregnant woman is subject to a kind of better come through at some point. Because I thought that captured, as another way of capturing really well, why this is so difficult. Because the, the challenge is to think of the mother as a subject, not to allow her to disappear into this fused state of the child. But there, it, there are so many aspects of motherhood, and that, that stood out for me in the paper, that that every mother in a sense has this moment where things are not under your control. From that moment of conception, things are not under your control. This isn't going to map onto the model of the completely autonomous subject. So I thought there's, there's two moments sort of brought out really powerfully in some ways. I suppose the tension in different ways has come up in many different papers and texts today between wanting to resist that really damaging model of complete self loss but still finding ways of thinking about motherhood that do acknowledge that it does involve a lot of control in certain kinds of ways. So it's not really a question. Could, could I sort of add a bit to it to sort of support what you said? Um, the second character in the novel, Legrand, um, also lived as one with his mother, and she abandoned him. 
But he actually says at one point, they live so close together that he didn't know whose head was which, and which, whether they were one person or two. Which is, of course, how scientists like to tell us babies perceive the world, too, that everything, everything's them. So I do find that quite interesting. NDI does also deal with separation, and it's usually very disastrous as well. Although the latest novel, the one that's come out this year, La Divine, is a bit different. <laughs> but hopefully you read it, I will tell you about it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. I, I don't know. There is one there. Yeah. Um, Two minutes. I think it's a thing. <laughs> I was considering whether I should ask a question because it's not strictly speaking related to uh, what we were just talking about. But um, listening to um, Dawn and Sarah Jane describe their research just um, struck me. It would be really interesting to know whether you asked your um, interviewees, uh, the ones who have children, what, why they have children, like, because you were saying why, why did you choose not to have children, but is the same question relevant for women who do decide to have children, and I didn't know if that was something that you asked and what yeah. kind of responses you got. Yeah, because I was interested in whether, quite quickly, in the pilot, and, and very much, it seemed that there was something quite juicy about what we mean by choice mm -hmm. in, in this context, and so um, with, with both sets of, of women, um, and those that fall between those two be polar categories as well, those who are ambivalent, those who are and stuff. Um, yeah, I did ask, I kind of <coughs> asked the questions actually, and the way I would start most interviews is, you know, thank you very much for taking part. Tell me about, tell me the story about how you came to this choice. And what's interesting about both, what's interesting about both, both experiences, both, both groups, is that the, the way they talk about choice is often in terms of language of vocation. Um, you, you saw that a little bit with some of the participants there, but the women who've chosen to have children want to see as part of as a vocation too. But interestingly, they're claiming, they are claiming it's a choice. They're quite keen on telling me about the times when they weren't sure that they wanted to have children, the heartfelt discussions with their husband. If they were career women, it was about how you, how, what are the problems with balancing that. Um, and um, so that was interesting. I think there was a little bit of, there is some colour as well at the grades of that. Um, I remember one, talking to one woman who I don't use Anglican, um, working class um, and not in paid work, but identifies as a feminist, and she's part of a feminist activist group and a feminist reading group. And she said, this is just going to, and she felt awful for saying this, but she said, I'm going to be really honest and I'm just going to tell you, I think there'll be some, there would be something wrong with me as a Christian, as a Christian woman if I didn't have children. I wouldn't be fulfilling a Christian value. And that goes against every feminist principle she said that she can hold dear. But she also said she thought there would be something slightly amiss with other women within the Christian church who chose to have children. So it's there as a choice. The language of choice is, is, quite, is quite rich. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, um, I guess the reason I was thinking about it was just um, I remember discussions in, a, in the context of um, bioethics about like the, the decision to have children and the various ways that that's uh, involved in kind of medical decision um, and kind of having a, a realization that there's no. I mean. We talk about uh, the choice not to have children sometimes as being a selfish choice. I think you mentioned it in relation to your interviews. Um, but is there really a non-selfish reason to choose to have children? Because in some sense you're saying, I want this. Um, and you're able to, in some cases, feel that desire. I guess if it's seen in terms of some divine yeah. plan, perhaps that's not. Yeah. You were going to say something before. <laughs> Are you still keen? Um, yes, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, listening to, to both your papers, and thank you, they were really uh, amazing papers, and I'm looking forward to reading the book yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your research is, is fascinating from an anthropological point of view. But I'm struck by, by you know, the similarity of, of women's struggles, irrespective of their backgrounds. And then, you know, what little I have done with, with Muslim women, it, it comes back to this. Yes, Mary is, is you know, one of the four, I call them the four formidable women in my presentation. But again, the way she is handled in, in, in classical texts where, you know, there isn't any Joseph in, in the Quran. So she's very much a single mother who's got to be things on her own. 
And it's, it's quite a struggle. And she's, she's through all, all on her own throughout this struggle. And then we you get to hear a little bit more about her. In fact, there was a conference I was at a week and a half ago where we looked at Mary and Christianity and Islam. But I mean, irrespective of this, but again, within Islamic context is where you often do not come across these strong um, emancipated women. Hagar, for example, is, is another woman who's central to um, Islamic texts. And I, and I recently learned that um, she's actually buried in Makkah, right next to the Kaaba, where Muslims go to perform her. So in practice, there's a woman who's central to Islamic belief, central to the Hajj, but you don't hear about that. And again, I, I found it fascinating to look at you know, Christian women having similar struggles. Yes, the context is slightly different, but I, for one, am inspired to go out and you know, do more. Yeah. And there, there are women who are doing it, so in Sarah, yes. there's Slee's stuff. And yes. there, there is an artist that, that Nick's written about who has depicted Mary kind of, you know, in the sink, washing of bottles, breastfeeding, yes. and that yeah. piece, piles of lining. There, there's an artist. There, there's even a Nicole. photograph of her spanking baby Jesus. Right, okay. <laughs> so, it, it's lovely, it, it, you know, those kind of images of, you know, Yes, Christine. Yes, I'm going to be a bit more sceptical about the research. Um, two questions. One is the, 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 the voluntary non-motherhood. And I know you are very cautious about using that as a title. But really what you mean is voluntary non maternity or something like that. It's not, you know, there's lots of mothers who yeah. give up their children, yeah. all of those things, as well as people who are adoptive mothers. Mm -hmm. And I, I just do think that's quite important. Yeah. And I suppose the other thing that really bothers me, I've been followed as a research object since I was born. Um, and actually, you know, it'd be very interesting, though you couldn't properly do it to go back through the data, because, for example, they excluded from the survey, which was for everybody born within 10 days of a particular year, not everybody, but then a, a, a subgroup, they excluded non-married women. And although we are followed up incredibly regularly, there was much more following up of those who had children. You know, so the whole issue to do with who was followed, what questions they were asked, etc., would have skewed the sample. But nevertheless, it would be very interesting for you to go back to some of that sort of historical data and have a look, because they used to ask us all sorts of things. Don't ask me about okay. what, the politics. So I imagine also spirituality and so on. But my worry about it is the narration that people, you know, you're asking them for their story of why they didn't have children or they did have children. And looking back over the kinds of narratives that I would have given over my life, they would have changed. And I would think, oh, I thought I did this at this stage because of this reason. But actually, now I realize, and you know, not any one of those realizations is necessarily going to be correct. Yeah, no, um, I, 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 absolutely. That's kind of the problem with qualitative work when you're trying yes. to get a snapshot of where somebody is at, at that time. So, your first point about the language, the language that I kind of said uh, right at the beginning, the voluntary child, because that's embedded in the sociology of parenting language. That's the language used by Leatherby and Gillespie and Gatchel and stuff. And I was really conscious of this kind of like neat bipolarization of the non voluntary childlessness. The language is incredibly awkward and it, it was one of the reasons why I was interested in also interviewing, so when I put out the call for participants I said if you're ambivalent or you're unsure or you've got no one, you know, then I'd like to talk to you too. So one woman I interviewed um, is part of the Evangelical Alliance um, and um, she, she said I really wanted to talk to you because I am very ambivalent, I don't know if I want children, I don't know what that means to my faith if I do and I don't, and I wanted to just to try and capture that now, actually. So that was interesting. And she said, well, I can't, I can't really voice this in church. I can't block up and say, by the way, actually, I know you keep telling me to be a good Christian woman, I should probably have lots of kids, but I don't think that's quite for me. So I, in such a 
small sample of us, even if I was trying to find ways of troubling that, the other way is going to use this woman that's adopted and fostered. So chosen not to have children biologically, but has chosen instead to, to foster and adopt. So I guess I was trying, even in a small sample, to trouble those, those, new, those new concepts. And then I think the problem with qualitative research, one of the problems is, is it's, well, it's not even a problem, it's just what it is. It's not representative, it doesn't really claim to be in that way. Um, it's, it doesn't fall into the logic of representation as uh, representability as, um, as some of the more quantitative approaches might. Um, and I think you're right, if, 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 if I had more money, <laughs> then that would be interesting to, to revisit that. It was one of the reasons as well I wanted to try and get women in their 20s, 30s and 40s so the women who were a bit older could reflect back and the younger women could give some sense of where they were at that stage when they're thinking about careers. But the cohort is um, the reason, again one of the reasons for choosing that age range was because feminism is in the ether, these women have been exposed to narratives of feminism and the loss of religion you know, with the contemporary framework. So. Okay, we'll yeah, you got my right. <laughs> you got wrong. <laughs> okay. We'll have another question here. Uh, it's going to be a very, very quick one. It's actually a follow-on. And I don't have the problem with you using the word motherhood at all, actually, and not motherhood. And I was wondering if any of the people that you interviewed had had biological children, gave them up for adoption, and therefore voluntarily chose not to be motherless mm -hmm. as such. Uh, so the motherhood as the social function mm -hmm. of motherhood, and whether or not if you did have any of those subjects, mm -hmm. for example, religion played a big part in the way they understood their role of maternity, I would say in terms mm -hmm. of the pregnancy, the giving birth, etc., with the non-mother mm -hmm. and their choice. Mm -hmm. I just wish I had said no. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> and that you know, and that was that that was something else. So if you knew of anyone, let me know. But um that yeah, unfortunately. The closer I came was a Catholic woman who became pregnant at sixteen, um, and kept had had a baby, um, didn't lose her kind of faith at all, but stopped going to church and then has returned to church now with babies for the time. She's a very young woman. But, you know, but, but now it's very critical of her decision back then. So even in that, she's got some retrospective view. She she came on the road so could look back a little bit about what that choice might have been. Thank you. Good question. Okay. Any more pressing questions? <laughs> they have to be fast. We've got two or three minutes before we close. And. Um, one of the questions that uh, we are very keen to, uh, to uh, you know, address is um, what insights can literary narratives and representations relative to this topic offer to interdisciplinary discussion? Now, I think we have actually, probably it is self-evident that, that literature is, can offer uh, lots of um, stimulus to um, discussion and to understanding of the problem surrounding the link between motherhood and religion and I think perhaps there isn't any point in going over that right now because of course we don't have time but one thing that did strike me is that um, well and I may be wrong but um, religion is normally the way I understand it a conservative force and it is a, a force that shapes women's lives and shapes uh, their uh, you know, experience, and uh, as we've seen in many te in the texts we've seen today, their um, you know, uh, way, the way they uh, live motherhood. Um, but it the, the, something that has struck me is two things, what we say today, uh, and one is how actually within Christianity, having children can be a, a hindrance. So if, obviously, this has to do with changes within churches, women being allowed to become priests has created lots of problems in other areas. And so being a mother does go against the career of priesthood for women. So that was something that I never reflected about, I didn't know. So that's something I've seen as new. The other thing is that, and we've seen it in, the, in the, uh, a couple of examples of um, of literature we've seen today, that religion actually can offer a template 
uh, something to step into when you don't know what to do. And so with the happy event, for example, um, uh, uh, extract, we see that uh, Barbara doesn't know what to do. Uh, she has lots of questions and so she gets answers without even asking from Miriam. And Miriam has a template there. She fits into what, really, what her religion her uh, religion tells her to do. And she, I'm not sure that she actually gives that sentence, they are my whole life, a positive meaning at all. And I see a lot of irony in that passage. Um, uh, and the, the scripture she goes on to, to, to give us is actually, Religion tells me to do this and I stick with it and I can survive that way. That is how I read it. And I'm not sure how Barbara takes that. How far, you know, how, whether she uh, takes on that lesson from Miriam. So one thing that I'd like to finish on is the fact that we, um, we should really try and read these texts because um, I think they can offer a lot of um, you know, insights, uh, especially for people who work outside literature, because they do give us solutions that we can't imagine. Literature, I think, offers solutions that we cannot imagine in everyday life. And also, I, I don't think that we can actually understand these texts without seeing what you know, goes on till the end. <laughs> what does Barbara do? <laughs> Does she go on to accept it? And uh, what does um, you know? I, uh, uh, what does uh, Rosie do? We seem in. I like your paper because you told us what, what she does. But the, the, if we um, allow me one second about the Virgin Mary, the Virgin Mary is God in every, so many novels. You know, just a very obvious example is Jeanette Winterson's Oranges are not the only fruit. And uh, the idea of the Immaculate Conception is there, and, um, and there are so many uh, examples. So um, she is a big, a big figure to try and sort out. <laughs> but probably, I, I hope that literature can offer uh, some some answers.